Hello everybody, my name is Tim Uchkin and today I'm going to talk about GearMan. Earlier today, uh, Paul showed you a diagram, an inverted uh, triangle, uh, and so far everybody's been talking at the lower end of that, at the CPU level and, and at the uh, chip level. This is more of, you know, how do you get parallelization at the application level for just normal people like me, not geniuses like the earlier speakers. Um, and uh, in my case, I uh, was contracted to jump on a project uh, for Anspiral uh, for a client, and they had chosen this stack of you know Linux, Postgres, Ruby, Rails uh, to uh, write this application. And the application required a lot of uh, scalability, for the lack of a better word. And uh, and the only way to get that, in my opinion, with for, with the chosen stack was Gearman. So I chose Gearman to get this done. And today I'm going to go through uh, what Gearman is and how you can work with Gearman and how Gearman helped us uh, to build this product. So, uh, what is Gearman? Um, Gearman is an anagram for manager. Uh, well, obviously it's more than that, but uh, it's a massively distributed, massively fault-tolerant fork mechanism. So it's basically just a fork mechanism. It allows you uh, to parallelize at at the fork level, at the application level, uh, without having to choose anything special, no special languages, no special CPUs. Uh, at its core, GearMan is just a protocol, and this protocol has multiple implementations. Um, the, originally, it was started as Perl server. Uh, there's also a C server, uh, which is at Launchpad. Um, there's also a C++ version, C++ version of this. Um, there are also several other ones in various stages of abandonment. There's a, a Erlang version. Uh, there's even a Ruby version that somebody kind of started and went along with for a while and then left. There's a fork of the C version with, uh, with the cron and epic uh, functionality built in. So uh, people have been fooling around with it and uh, I'm sure many people in here might, when they want to pick one of those up, and go. The client API uh, is available for almost any language. So you name it, there's probably a, a GearMan client for it. There's also, uh, more interestingly, uh, command line tools, so you can actually just use Bash to, to submit jobs and to process jobs from it. So, you know, if you can read pipes, you can do it. Uh, there's also uh, UDFs for uh, MySQL, Postgres, and Drizzle, so you can actually submit jobs from inside of triggers um, and store procedures, which is also quite interesting. Um, there's a subtle difference between a client and a worker. Client submits jobs, worker processes jobs, and obviously anything that functions as a client will more than likely function as a worker. So, including the command line tools. So, why would you use GearMan as opposed to something else? Uh, probably, uh, I would say, the number four flexible application design is the most, the best reason to use GearMan. It's open source, lots of things are open source, it's simple, it's fast. Uh, no single point of failure, but again, a lot of things like RabbitMQ or AMQP or whatever would give you as well. But uh, GearMan is more flexible than all of those things. So, um, for example, GearMan uh, gives you persistent queues or not. Uh, by default, it's in memory only, but you can uh, choose your various uh, persistence options. You can use off the shelf databases like MySQL and Drizzle, Tokyo Cabinet, Memcache, and I'm sure there's a couple of pieces of code around for just about any kind of data store that you want. Or you can write your own, it's not that hard up here. <laughs> um, you can work in the foreground synchronously or in the background asynchronously. And I'll be showing examples of, of how to work with both of these in a little bit. Um, it's actually quite simple. And um, large scale applications work well, but the great thing is it's very easy to start off simple. It's very easy to start off small. You just, you know, app get installed Gearman plug in your code, and off you go. And if you have just one worker, no problem. If you have 150 workers, no problem. Um, how does it work? Well, basically, it works, you have this broker, which is the job server, and you have n number of these that you set up. Um, of course, it's recommended you have at least two. Uh, clients connect to, uh, and again, in terms of nomenclature, client, somebody that submits a job, is requesting some work be done. Uh, connect to any of the job servers, and the workers connect to all the job servers. So if one job server goes down, then the worker fetches the jobs from the other job server. It's important to note here that the job servers themselves are not communicating with each other. 
And I, you know, I think that's what maybe we can, if we have time, we'll talk about that later. Um, some of the use cases, uh, just, you know, this scatter gather, map reduce, asynchronous queues, and pipeline processing. These are the ways I use it. Um, I'm sure uh, there are many, many other ways to use it, uh, to use it, but in my case, these are the functions that I took. Um, scatter gather is basically you take a job, you break it up into little pieces, you hand them off to workers, the workers get them done, and feed you back the result. And normally, uh, this, this is done synchronously. Um, tasks don't need to be related. And uh, one of the interesting use cases of this is to push the logic to where the data is. So if, for example, you need to lead a log file or to process a binary or to take a snapshot or whatever, um, you just push that work, you put the worker on that machine and you just push that work and then it's done fast. So you don't have to fetch a huge amount of data over the network. Um, and that's this is basically how it works. You have a client that missed the jobs, splits them up, and you have a resize image worker. Uh, maybe somebody does a location search, maybe you know, whatever, a database query. So each one of these jobs could be done on the machine where the database is, the machine where the images are, whatever. Um, MapReduce, um, this is the one personally I use a lot uh, because uh, especially if you have a large number of records you need to process, you can kind of break these up and say worker X, you know, process records one through N, whatever, N plus one through Y, whatever. So um, this, this could also be multi-tier and they could be asynchronous and in my case, it's mostly asynchronous, but you can also do them synchronously, obviously. Um, in this case, the client takes a task, breaks it up into little pieces, hands them off to workers, and a worker can then further break that task up and give it to other workers to get it done. So, and of course, you can just use it as a simple asynchronous queue. Um, in this case, it'd be no different than using any other queue. You just, uh, this is especially handy for long latency tasks like emails, log entries, um, indexing and batch operations, which is. And this, I use this a lot, which is a client it acts as both a client and a worker. So a client submits a task, the worker does something and then takes the result and hands it off to another worker for further processing and it just goes on and on and on. And when you do something like this, more often than not, you can keep the state in the data that itself as you're passing along or if you want to, you can keep the state in a centralized database uh, and then each worker would have to coordinate the state of the job. So uh, here's some simple examples. In my case, again, I'm using Ruby, so this, this is all Ruby code. It should be relatively easy to understand for everybody. Um, asynchronous processing is basically <laughs> a one-liner in Ruby, which is great. So you, you create the Gearman client and then you say do task, you give the name of the queue, you pass some data and then you specify whether or not it's going to be background task or not. Um, now, there are additional pieces of data you can pass in there. You can pass in, for example, um, the name of your client. Uh, you could pass in some sort of a unique ID for the job and various other options that Gearman allows for. But um, again, this could be just done as a one-liner, which is very handy. Um, workers themselves, very easy to do. You read, you, um, Register an ability, so in this case the worker can recalculate the index and Gearman connects to your worker um, and then passes you some data and a job ID. And then uh, the job object, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, basically at this point it's up to the worker to know what that piece of data is. As far as, as, far as the technically is concerned, it's just a string. So the worker has to know, you know what that string represents. In this case, uh, it's some sort of a serialized object, you unserialize it, you start working on it. Um, but it could be anything, again, just a string as far as Gearman's concerned. Um, a little more complex, client in this case, uh, where uh, the, the, work, the client submits the task and then registers events, what to do if there's an exception, what to do when the work is complete, what to do if there's a warning, what to do when a retry condition is reached, etc. And what happens when the, uh, worker fails. In this case, these are all lambdas. So, and this is how you return data to a synchronous client. <laughs> I mean, in, in, this is just, in my case, it's just pure Ruby. So you just return a value from your function like you would return any value from any function. And uh, the client takes that, 
uh, turns it into a string and dumps it. Now, if the, your return value is an object and can't be turned into a string, then you know obviously you're responsible for turning that into a string before you pass it on to GearMan. And then it's up to you what that string representation could look like. Could be JSON, could be XML. As in the previous example, just could be a, a partial object of some sort. You just dump it back in. GearMan will duly deliver it back to the client. And um, if you can also raise exceptions. For synchronous processes only, obviously. For asynchronous processes, if you raise an exception in your code, GearMan will count that job as not being done and then submit it to a next available worker. And if all your workers have the same, I don't know, uh, exception, then that job will just stay in GearMan forever until some worker processes it successfully. However, if, if the job is submitted synchronously, then this exception will get raised back to the client, and then the on exception uh, method will be called. And so you can then process that exception, report it, whatever you're going to need to do with it. Um, you can, uh, oops, did I go the wrong way? Yep. Um, you can also return the data to the client in chunks. So this is good for progress bars or whatever. So you just uh, uh, do some processing, and then at some point you say, OK, well, um, here, so this is, uh, in, in this case, you say on data, do this, on complete, do this. And then you just add the task onto the, onto the job. And then on the uh, worker side, the worker does it and it sends a chunk of data. It sends a chunk one, chunk two, chunk three, and at the end, it sends an EOD. And at that point, Gearman knows that the job's done and closes the job out. And you can also um, <coughs> query the state of the queue. Um, so this is a simple function I wrote, uh, but uh, it's basically just to open a socket, send a command, GearMan sends you back some data, and you just process it. In this case, I, I took it and, and uh, dumped it out, and what it shows you is the name of the queue, in this case, at the bottom, for example, the queue's name is Twitter, there are 126 jobs in the queue, there are three uh, running workers, and there's uh, four workers total. So you get a good idea of what's happening in your queue at any given time. How many workers are registered? How many of them are working? How big is your backlog? Blah, blah, blah. You can also take all this data, obviously, and send it to some sort of a monitoring system, uh, SNMP, whatever you need to do, and then raise alarms if the queues are backed up. Um, you could do all kinds of interesting stuff. If, for example, you're always expecting 24 workers of some type, and you don't have 24 workers, maybe something's wrong, raise an alarm. Do something with it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can, there are also database UDFs for Postgres and MySQL, and of course, of course uh, Drizzle. So in this case, um, I don't know, this is really powerful to me. <laughs> you know, uh, something happens in your database, uh, some value changes, and then you want to submit this to a job. Some state changes, you want to submit this to a worker, and the database just uh, uh, submits that, connects the gear man, submits the worker, and then the worker does whatever it needs to do. So. Um, Personally, I mean, a lot of people are probably spooked about putting this kind of functionality in their database, and that's fine too, you don't have to, but you can if you want. And of course, in writing any kind of a complex application, you're gonna have all kinds of optional ingredients in your mix. You're gonna have a database, in my case it was Postgres. Uh, you're gonna have, uh, you can have shared or distributed file systems to use as locking mechanisms or you know, share data or whatever. I would not obviously be putting large chunks of binary data into the gear man to be passed around. Um, you can uh, leverage uh, other types of protocols. And, um, you know, in my case, image manipulation and full text indexing. Um, these are jobs that you want to do in the background most of the time. So uh, you're going to have all kinds of other tools. The great thing about gear man is it's a very simple protocol, tell not like thing. You know, you connect, you send some strings, you get some strings back. So you can kind of use your imagination and go wild on what you can do with it. Uh, but um, uh, most of the time, the client libraries and the stuff that you get for free is, is plenty. The, I kind of want to talk about timeouts a little bit. There, there is no timeout in GearMan. So if, you, if a client connects to GearMan and says that it's working on a job, GearMan will wait forever for that job to finish. Uh, it will not time out. It's up to you. It's up to you to monitor your clients, make sure they're not in, stuck in a loop somehow. It's up to you to monitor your queues. No, nothing's going to be raised. Uh, so 
um, you may want to take care of that yourself. Or you can kind of leverage this for your own purposes as well. Um, so, now, you know, what are the shortcomings? Um, this is kind of weird, that, that the clients and the workers must connect to all servers. That, that if one of your gearmen goes down, the, the data that's in that queue is not known to any other, other job brokers. So you have to, if it comes back up again, I'll pick it up again. But if that machine is blown up and it's on fire, then you, know, you might have lost that data. So you have to take some precautions to make sure that data, that data is uh, been replicated someplace, and you know you can do that at the database level or whatever you want to do. Um, it's a little bit slower than, let's say, Rabbit or you know AmpyCube or something like that. But in my case, you know who cares? A couple of milliseconds here and there. I mean, uh, in my case, that doesn't really matter. It takes longer to connect to the database and do a query than that, so I don't really don't care. Um, I'm not crazy about the way it logs. Um, I think it could tell you a lot more details on the log, but, um, and as I said earlier, the steps must be taken to assure recovery of queued messages if a server is completely destroyed. So, um, and finally, small community, the development has slowed, uh, a couple of the lead developers are, you know, kind of not that interested in it anymore. So I think this is a really great opportunity for people here, for example, if somebody wants to jump on a really interesting project. Um, it's stable, it works well. Uh, it's, uh, the, there's a couple of maintainers from Ubuntu on it. Uh, all the code's on Launchpad, so if anybody wants to go take a look at it. And people are talking about putting some more functionality in it, especially Epic support, which seems to be very interesting. Like, you know, put in a job, and then GearMan will submit that job in five minutes. Or, you know, you pick up a job, you decide you don't want to do it, but you don't want to give back the to Gearman to immediately hand off to somebody else. So you give it back to Gearman with a delay and say, you know, don't touch this for another hour. Uh, or submit this every Tuesday at 5 p.m. or whatever. So if you want to get involved, gearman.org, um, there's the IRC. And that's it. Short and sweet. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, questions, please. Again on the back. Is, is it architecture independent? Uh, no. I, I'm sorry, did you ask me if it was dependent or independent? Independent. Uh, yes, as it, in it's architecture you can, independent. Right, yeah. you can run, a, run it on little endian, big endian, 64, 32-bit. Uh, you just compile it from source. Uh, I, I don't think it runs on Windows. I, I think it's got to be a unix -y thing. But you just get the source code and compile it. OK, so please. Join me to say thank you with the team. <laughs>